So it's very nice to be back with MSU students uh, doing a little professional development. So, um, oops, continue the meeting. There we go. So we are looking at today at the right stuff or how I learned to stop worrying and love writing professional emails. So I know there's, I only see a couple of you there, but does anyone know um, the title I spooked for that I borrowed? What movie is that from? Actually, any of you for me know. Ring the bell. No, that's an older one. That one's from Dr. Strangelove. So good movie if you have time to catch it this summer. But uh, Rachel did already introduce me. I am Erin with Auto Owners Recruiter. I am their senior tech recruiter. Um, so again, oh, Dr. Strangelove, there it is. Yes, Charles, good job. <laughs> um, I will kind of keep an eye on that chat for questions as we go. And let's begin uh, at the beginning with why on earth should you care about something like this? Um, so I am glad you're here in person, or if you are watching this later, it is a very important topic because the language that you pick is going to play a major role in the way that people see you and respond to you in the workplace. In fact, it even counts in school. So um, you may have been a recipient of one of these, a sloppy or a confusing email. You're just going to wreak havoc on time and efficiency, which is a bummer. Um, so you've maybe been part of an email where just a, a literal flood happens after it because there's a typo or a date and the day of the week didn't line up or any number of reasons. Um, whereas the flip side of that, if you consistently send well-crafted emails uh, that are tightly written, concise, get to the point, it really shows you respect people's time, um, which is very important. And it shows you're articulate. That's a, a definite mark of a professional. And one of my personal favorite things, you become influential. So people are gonna take the time to read what you send them because they know it won't be you know, super stressful to get through or it's not a novel every time you send something. So crafting concise in the polished message, definitely a big step to becoming a professional and uh, really garnering some uh, respect out there in the workplace. Okay, so this is a bit interactive. So everybody back to your chat, take a look at this email. What seems to be missing? Most stuff is there, but something extremely important is missing. And I will give that a second or two because I know you need to read through it. And then here's another hint. What is missing from that? The subject, Garth, yes, for, <laughs> yes. Good job, Garth, gold star today. Please write a subject line. Ah, I love mysteries when I'm doing my leisure reading, but I can do without them in my work and personal email. If you drop a subject line, if it comes through blank, um, you're really risking that email getting uh, not read right away, getting mistaken for spam, uh, other, other things like that. You don't wanna put your subject line in all capitals because that will also sometimes mistake it for spam. And don't put a URL on the subject line. You're gonna get scooped out of a lot of companies filters, um, email filters, if you put in stuff like that. So just a concise subject line that says what is in that email. Um, don't do vague things like, please read this or what we talked about today because that's gonna make no sense to people after that day. You know, we get a lot of email in the professional world. A lot of people sort by subject. Um, so you want to always put in that subject line. Please and thank you. And even though it's one of the first things I'm going to talk about, I often write my subject line last. I get what I need in the email and then I come up with my concise few word statement to tell people what's in there. Any email should contain uh, of course, your brief greeting, we're always civil and cordial, uh, the actual message you need to tell folks, your call to action. So that's a clear statement on what you need and from who, who's supposed to provide it, and always a sign off. Don't just, you know, do a first name kind of thing, but we'll get to that a little bit later in the end. A great place to start, think to yourself, all right, who's my audience? Because an email to your boss is going to be very different than an email to a coworker or a fellow student. And that's going to be very different from an email to like a casual friend. Or when you're in a company, 
there's going to be a difference between writing someone in the company and writing someone externally, as we say. So as you're thinking of your audience, you want to think to yourself, okay, what's my tone need to be? Is this very formal? Am I introducing myself for the first time? Or is this informal? These are people I talk to every day. Um, and then consider what your recipient's going to understand. Do you need to go like way big picture with what you're trying to get? Uh, because the folks won't know the nitty gritty? Or is this like you're asking something about a project where everyone knows the nuances, they know the lingo, and you can um, use more specific things to get to your point faster. So you got to kind of gauge between that's the fun of it. And sometimes both types of people are on the email. So you, you kind of need to hit that sweet spot in the middle. And you do want to consider privacy. Um, you may, I don't know if you've ever gone out there yourself and researched um, out there in Google or anything, but the, the jury's kind of out on the BCC, which stands for blind carbon copy. So some people feel that uh, using this feature isn't necessary because either someone should know they're on the email or they shouldn't be on it. And that is fair to some extent. Um, but there are going to be instances where you maybe need to send an email um, to get information from people and all of those people need that same information. Um, but they don't need to know each other's emails. So that happens to me all the time. For example, when I am emailing our tech interns, I might ask them to confirm a graduation month and year. I need them all to see that same exact message. And they do not need to see each other's uh, personal emails because I did this before the season. Uh, began. Uh, whereas, you know, once they're in the doors, they can use a company email, which anyone could look up. But so I want you to put some consideration into whether or not to use the blind carbon copy feature. Uh, something that's not talked about too much. Here's a fun lesson Aaron learned the hard way. <laughs> you never know when a certain email, any email might be forwarded and you don't know to whom it may be sent. Um, that did catch me off guard in my early years of my career. And uh, things are forwarded more than you might think. So heads up on that. It will make you rethink how you write your emails. Um, and you don't yourself want to forward an email that's maybe pages and pages and pages. So if you do decide to forward something, that's fine, but give a bit of thought to the email in its entirety. If there's like straight up 20 pages of past content that the new person maybe won't need, just clear it out the bottom. Um, that's what I do. And I sort of start with the email that's relevant for them going up to the future and explaining why I'm forwarding this. Um, this isn't in my formal presentation, but it, it just inspired me. Don't just forward something and say nothing. Like why, why did you send it? Um, there must be a reason. And yes, you maybe even told the person a reason, but remember a lot happens during a work day, during a school day. So even though you could be talking on the phone with someone saying, I'm going to forward you this email, go ahead and write a sentence or two in the email so that when they reference it, because it could be a while later, they know what's going on with it. That is definitely helpful in the professional world. All right, uh, for the next section, it's time to word craft. I love that term. I'm an English major myself. So I love words. I love what they do. I love how influential they can be. But that is if you choose the right ones. Um, so uh, back to the chat. Um, I think everyone will know this, but what does TMI stand for? Too much info, yes, Jack, it sure does. <laughs> that is what we wanna avoid for the number one tip. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about other things to avoid, but honestly, when it comes to emails, succinct is best. You want to summarize what you need and as tempting as it might be, if you had a hard day or you're having technical difficulties, don't spill your life story into that email or I had to reboot three times, like, Okay, we're sorry, right? Um, vent that somewhere else, but it does not go into the email that you need. And then as you're typing it up, if you notice there's just more and more content, think to yourself, hey, could or should some of this be an attachment? Um, for example, if you're gonna ask a handful of people to choose between three options, maybe in the body of the email, that's what you put. I need your choice by X date of one through three. Please see attached for more details of each plan. Cool. 
they can get through that email, they know what they need to do, and they know that the extra details are attached, don't forget to attach it, to the email. Um, so that is also a great tip. So just as you're typing, if it seems like it's getting long, maybe you make use of the attachment, maybe it's two separate emails, maybe you need a meeting. Just sort of depends on the link that you hit there. Okay, if you take nothing else away from this webinar, which, eh, but hopefully <laughs> you take away more than one thing. But if it's one thing only, I want you to remember this tip. Do not pepper your emails with this feeble and sad word, which is just. For example, I was just wondering, I just wanted to, it's just my two cents. Uh, that type of thing. It is unnecessarily apologetic and you're really undercutting your ideas and your credibility. If it's in there from habit, just you freeform typing, read through that email before you send it. And I want you to pick out every single instance of that, unless it's just like freedom and fair, that kind of just, that's fine. Leave those alone. <laughs> but if you are uh, saying it in that other sense, please remove it. It's, it really undercuts. Um, your ideas and you don't need to do that. If you're writing in this email, you have something to say. So make it clear. Ditto for these phrases. Oh, sorry to bother you. Like stop apologizing. Either it needs to be an email or it doesn't. So, you know, don't add in extra words. When you saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> As a is not, not a great way to, to gain followers. Or, I, and this is my personal preference, that last one. I hate the phrase, I hope this helps. Because it's like, you put a big shoulder shrug into your email, like, mm, hope it helped you. Um, whenever I feel that way, I say to myself, okay, did I help? Did I answer their questions? Or is there more information that I need to know so that I am confident I answered their questions? I figure out which one of the two it is and I either ask more or, um, I do some other kind of parting for my, uh, you know, for my ending of my email when I'm trying to do a wrap it up statement. So don't like those. So that was just, sorry to bother you. And I hope this helps. All right, another tip, you uh, will do well to anticipate the questions your recipients are gonna have. Uh, that's fun. It's an exercise everyone should do, um, whether they're writing an email or starting to create a project or whatever it is. It is going to be more efficient to sit there, think of your audience, think of the information you're telling them, and then uh, take a guess at what their immediate questions are going to be, and then answer them in that first email, in that very same email. Um, that is very helpful. So ask yourself, what would they wonder about, or what about you know this topic? that type of thing. And um, definitely give a deadline. So if you ask someone to do something and you don't tell them when by, they are, first of all, going to assume they can absolutely do it at their leisure. Um, and that might not be the case. You might need it in like three days. <laughs> so you do want to spell out a day and sometimes even a time of day that you need it answered uh, or a response by. And please do not get into the habit of making every email, I need to hear back ASAP. That is not going to go well. It does not speak well for your time management skills. Um, you just, you really don't want to do that. Like, okay, every now and then, sure. You know, maybe we're on vacation, we're catching up, uh, things happen. There are busy times of the year, but do not make it a habit to constantly be like, I need this ASAP. Um, okay, the next has a little bit. Uh, of a surprise to it, if you are familiar with auto owners. So kind of a big deal for our company is our slogan that we are refreshingly human. You will talk to a person. That person um, is able to, you know, use your name, look up, you know, your account or your policy and just have a real conversation with you. Um, so don't let this next one surprise you. <laughs> because uh, a, a very strong tip is if you need to give someone bad news or it's less than positive, it's gonna happen in life. It's not always gonna be, you know, cherry dandy, ah, oh, it was amazing. Sometimes you're gonna need to tell people things were wrong or um, they could have been done in a bit of a better manner or whatever. But if it's that type of news, take some time in that email 
and depersonalize the language. Um, so I know auto owners is big on everything uh, being personal and it's it's a human touch, but if it is bad news, um, it's a great tip to not make it personal. And I do have some I do have some examples of this. But before I click over to those, you do want to remember, depending on certain news, maybe it should be a phone call, <laughs> depending on um, what type of news you're trying to convey there. So things, my what I call it's not personal examples. Um, for example, we're insurance, right? So I gave you a couple of insurance ones. We're not renewing your policy would be statement number one versus the less personal due to several at fault accidents, the policy will be set to non-renew August 1st. Okay, we've given them the reason, we're explaining what's happening, but it loses that like us versus them feel, that confrontational feel when we are taking away words like we and you uh, type of thing. Here's another one, you're no longer getting our homeowners discounts versus the homeowner's discount will be removed due to and whatever the reason is. And you're gonna notice in these examples, we are telling people the why, or I would have if I'd had room on that slide. That is such a good mark of a professional email. Um, people will understand more, they will retain more if you are telling them the reasons for what is happening. So you always wanna remember that in your writing. Uh, another one that's a little more general, um, maybe you're going to train someone one day. So you could do something like you didn't follow the procedures for this and messed it up. Like, ow, right? Everyone makes mistakes. <laughs> um, a little bit of a more gentle way to say that would be procedures were not followed and that resulted in a preventable error. Okay, so no one's pointing fingers. We're looking for the what went wrong and not the who did it. Another mark of a professional. Um, but yes, remember that tip. If it's bad news or something needs correcting, take a second and depersonalize that language. All right, I'm checking on the chat for any questions. We're good so far. Uh, next up, I have a little sign in my cubicle that says this actual phrase, edit or regret it, because it's so true. <laughs> um, it really bears repeating, read, and reread your message. Anytime I have kind of like popped it in there a sentence or two and whoop, send before I reread it, I have regretted it instantly because I had a typo or I, I said the wrong thing. I left out a letter, um, you know, maybe spell check didn't catch something quick enough with this little red underline kind of a thing. Um, just take your hand off that mouse, read it through at least once. Okay. And while you're doing that, here are some specifics on what to edit for, what to review for. Um, we do have time. I'm going to go ahead and go through these. So goes without saying, right? Uh, you're in college. You've already learned this stuff. Um, proper punctuation, spelling, and grammars, number one. Next up, do not <laughs> overdose on those exclamation points, uh, you know, like this. Um, going to the chat and it's like, wow, like, yes, you're excited. But actually what that does in an email, it just comes across as really childish. Like if you're excited, cool, stick to the one exclamation point, <laughs> but an overdose is, is not a, it's a little overzealous, right? A little much. You want to put your call to action so that what you were asking people to do, you want that at the beginning, or you want that at the end. You don't want to hide that in the middle with all your other information. So I like to put in my greeting, I put in my content. I like to end with it and I put it in its own separate little paragraph so people see it. They, if they glance, they are going to see what I'm asking them to do and when. Um, so do not pepper it in, like don't intertwine it and in all this other information. Make it clear, concise, and separated from the other parts of the message. This is, okay, when you get into a company, you will quickly learn. Um, some resources are finite. You cannot send gigantic things time after time. Pictures, lists, um, look at your attachment before you send it. And if it is a very large size, consider making it a link to somewhere on a network drive or um, compressing it. Or there's a various amount of things that you can do to make it smaller, but do not be that person 
who sends the email with such a large attachment that uh, the person receiving it, their inbox shuts down because it's full. They do not get their messages for the rest of the day and, and things don't go great. Um, so always check that attachment size. Double and triple check your dates and recipients. Um, again, you wanna make sure the date you're telling them is the day of the week that you said it was. If you're recycling an email, we've all done it, I know, we have the same thing to say maybe with slight updates, check the year, you know, check that date and day lineup again, check the recipients. Um, if you get into a larger company, or even if you don't, people have the same last name, right? I cannot tell you how many times I get Jennifer McLaughlin's email and she gets mine. Um, because we both work in the tech field um, and people are just, you know, MCL and it fills in and they hit enter and they do not stop and see which first name filled in there. <laughs> um, so check those carefully before you hit send. In fact, it's a great best practice. Type your email and then stick the people in. That way, if you accidentally send it early, whoops, um, if you hadn't filled in who's getting it, it won't go anywhere. Um, so that's a nice safety feature you could build in for yourself. You do wanna avoid over abbreviating. Um, uh, it's okay to do some uh, common phrases, I think from time to time, but there are certain emails I've received. It, they were using acronyms I wasn't familiar with. Um, so I've, I've even seen a, a couple of my uh, folks that I hired, so some interns who converted, they were signing emails with V slash R. I don't know what that means. I, I assigned it as meaning. I said, okay, maybe they mean very respectfully. I don't know, I was lost. I still need to ask them that <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, but you do not wanna over abbreviate in your email. Just think about that audience and are they gonna understand either acronyms you're using or whatever type of abbreviation you might want to put in there. Passive voice should be avoided. Yes, I wrote that in passive voice as a joke. Um, but just remember, generally speaking, if you do the passive voice, it's just more words that are saying the same thing, but they're taking longer to say it. Um, so I, during my reread, I will check for that. And, um, you know, I clean that up and put it back into the active voice as quickly as I can. Email should not contain confidential information. That is not the place for it. And uh, when you, or if you get an email with the feature that will let you mark an email as high priority, please don't use it for every single email. <laughs> that is crying wolf. Um, people will quickly learn that if you send that with every single email, they're gonna assume it's not a high priority because every single one of your emails are. Um, so when it comes time for a, you actually do need this quickly kind of a situation, You've, you've spent your nickel, right? You've already used that, hey, this will make it stand out kind of a feature. So a heads up on that one to be careful with. And you do wanna run yourself an ambiguity check. Read through what you're saying and go, could someone interpret it this way, this way, this way? I mean, you don't wanna spend all day at it, but do, you know, read it out loud to someone and say, what do you think that meant? Um, that would be perfectly fine. So those are a good, a really good checklist for your edit or regret it review. All right, moving along. Always wrap it up with a signature. And I know you're um, still students, but consider using uh, some kind of branded email. So obviously mine's gonna have my company, right? Let's take a look at that. I have an external version and I have an internal version. Um, so the full or external are like, I am branding myself auto owners. Whereas I go to shortened or an internal one, people know I work here. Um, I do have the link in that one. I can remove it and sometimes I do. It just kind of depends on who I'm writing. But uh, pretty much any information somebody needs to contact me is gonna be in that. Um, I'm going to show you a really good student version that's completely made up info because I don't want to right, give anyone's confidential information out here. Um, most generic name ever, Jerry, Jamie Smith at MSU. But when I receive a signature like this, for example, after a career fair or after um, some kind of recruiting event, they have packed so much information 
that I want to know into this beautiful and concise signature. So I know at a glance, what college was this? What's their year? What are they studying? Where is that email in case I want to, you know, quickly forward it to somebody or if I needed to call them right there, I can tell that's a cell phone number. Um, I love when I get stuff like, look how good it looks. Like it really makes people stand out um, in their student years if they put in something like that. You could also consider different titles you might have like, oh, I'm president of ACM, you know, pop it in there, cool. Um, do ask what you're allowed to use um, when it comes to logos and such, right? We don't wanna pull anyone's copyrighted or you know intellectual property type of thing. So ask those questions before you use things, but um, I think those are wonderful and a great tool to use. Uh, for the next tip, my best one, give it space. You will be amazed how much you will catch if you just wait until after lunch or if you can wait until the next day. On that reread, when you've been able to walk away from it, you are gonna catch so much more. Um, I, if it's a really important email, or it's a big proposal and I'm asking for things, I lock myself away in a conference room and I sit there and I read it out loud. So I can hear the word flow. I can tell if anything sounds odd, um, kind of falls on the ear weirdly, that type of thing. Um, if you're able and things aren't overly confidential, which you wouldn't put in an email anyway, have someone else read it. There's been a time or two I've pulled a teammate over and said, mm, how's this tone sound before I hit send type of a thing. Um, nothing is wrong with that, but you get the time to give it space when you are, you know, proactively looking ahead at your workflow, at your due dates, deadlines, things like that. So you're not constantly writing in a hurry. This has to be sent today. The best emails, the most influential, the easiest to read, the most succinct, um, we're given time to breathe and to be molded and to have more than one go through. Another quick tip as we approach the end here, and it's called on the flip side. And by that, I mean responding to emails, uh, just a handful of things for you to know. Um, in the business world, in the company world, it is expected you answer them in a timely manner, but it really need not be instant. If somebody needs you like now, they're probably gonna call you or chances are pretty decently high. You're gonna have some kind of messaging system. And I'm pointing over here because I have Slack. It's not open right now because I don't want to be distracted, but um, it, that's usually the way people go if they need something immediately would be those instant messengers or a phone call. So if you do get an email, you have some time, okay? Um, you don't, and you really shouldn't get distracted by every single one that immediately comes in. Like, yes, keep up on your inbox, but don't let it interrupt your entire workday by you constantly going, oh, new email, oh, new email. Um, so as you learn whatever email tool you're given, you will uh, have certain alerts that you could turn on and off and you will learn what's right for you there. When you're responding, did you answer everything that was asked of you or did you at least address it if you didn't have the answer right then? So uh, total pet peeve when I've asked three questions, somebody replies back and answers one and just doesn't even reference the other stuff. like. Did you not see that part or, you know, what other questions might you have had? So did you answer everything that was in that email? And a note of caution on reply all. It is rarely, rarely needed. Um, maybe, I don't know, whoever's sending it, if it's sent to a lot of recipients, they may tell you whether or not to use that feature. But I will just say for the sake of, um, you learning, it's it's rarely needed that you need to tell everyone your reply. So careful with that. And I do want to wrap up with one of my favorite quotes. It's from a French mathematician, scale as it would be. I would have written a shorter letter, but I did not have the time. Short writing takes time. I know that's counterintuitive. Uh, it takes that time to trim, to rearrange, to really pick that perfect word choice. But boy, does it overall save time, helps you develop that great reputation as a really wonderful communicator. Um, and that is my advice for you. So uh, happy writing in your emails. And I would be uh, very glad to take any questions that you might have before we wrap up this seminar.
All right, guys, so feel free to unmute yourselves or write in the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, I'll go ahead and kick us off, Erin, uh, with a question. Sure. Can you give some advice, especially um, reaching out to a recruiter, but this can also work, you know, internally during an internship, um, not hearing back. What is the best timeline for professional communication to respond um, and seek, you know, another another chance at replying um, or, um, you know, the way to craft that email as well. So both timeline and, you know, what they should say in that email when maybe they haven't heard back and they're um, seeking out a uh, response again. Mm, okay. I would think any given professional should be able to answer, unless they're traveling, uh, within a week or two. So if it's approaching the end of that second week, I would take that original email. I'd do a reply on it. Uh, and I would say something along the lines of, oh, you know, hello again, I was checking into this. Is there any additional information I can offer you? Um, it's just a gentle nudge. You could consider some other method. So if you tried their main email, maybe try them on LinkedIn um, this time around. I would also send an email reminder, depending on how you know badly I wanted to hear back type of a thing. You, you do want to be very careful. You don't want to continually check like, you know, if it's been a half a day or a day and you're checking and you're checking and you're checking, people do not like that. <laughs> I will really caution against that. Um, and another way to help yourself with this is to and I know it's not easy to know, but people do have busier seasons than others. So um, if you are told or given access or you know that someone's on the road for a week and a half, you know, or they've been on vacation for two full weeks and they're just back in the country, give them that catch up time. And then, you know, a little, a few days in there for them to get through the avalanche that was in their inbox or their workflow and then they're freed up to do things in real time again. So you kind of do need to be strategic. Um, if they don't answer at all, that's that's kind of rude, right? <laughs> um, I don't have an excuse for them or a real reason. Uh, they should you know, at least respond, um, letting you know they received it. Um, even if it's just sort of a, here's where we go from here or type of a message. Um, that's, I think that's all I got for that one, yes. Anyone else? <laughs> What's a quiet crowd today? I know it's Charles. Awesome. Charles weekend. says excellent talk and says thank you in the chat. So yeah, I will echo that. Um, Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone's uh, radio silent. I counted to 10. That's usually my, <laughs> my <laughs> little trick to see if anyone chimes in. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, if anyone does have any follow up questions, I don't know if you're willing to share your email in the chat. Yeah. yeah Professionally in. reach out to you and practice all this communication that you. Yes, that would be a great idea. Um, and yeah, certainly if you're interested in auto owners. Um, they are a big hire of our computer science students, also data science. So mm -hmm. those majors that might be interested in connecting with auto owners, I'm sure Erin would love to chat with you about opportunities as well. I would, yeah. I'll chime in here. Don't forget the math majors. I know they're usually combined with a lot of your majors and minors. So <laughs> yes, uh, you're very welcome. Hopefully everyone learned uh, at least one new tip, if not a few. And uh, really my pleasure. So have a great rest of your day.